If you are in the middle of your flight training, if you're a CFI, or if you're at a regional airline, this podcast is for you. Now, our guest this week is Sean O'Connor. He is a Southwest Airlines FO, but more importantly, he is the founder of Project Aviator, which is a nonprofit helping future aviators achieve their dream of the job that they want by pairing them up with mentors in the industry. Now, I've known Sean for a number of years and watched him grow throughout the years from a CFI to a regional airline pilot, regional airline captain, and now a Southwest FO. So, super excited to have him on the podcast, and I think those that are in the pipeline right now will get a lot of value out of it. So, let's hear what Sean has to say. Going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, get it that I'm never going up, going up, going up, going up. All right, everybody, welcome to another podcast. Today, I have Sean O'Connor. Now, Sean and I met, uh, geez, it's probably been six, seven years ago uh, at University of North Dakota. It was actually at a hotel bar. (laughs) Funny how that happens. Funny how that happens. You know, pilots meeting in bars. But um, met uh, all those years back then. I've watched him come up uh, from, you know, being an instructor when I first met you to now... uh, being at Southwest. We're going to talk about your journey here. And you got to Southwest and you didn't stop there. You decided to give back with your new prof- your nonprofit, Project Aviator. So we're going to get into that too. So today's podcast is going to have a lot of good value on it. Uh, for those of you on the come up, show you kind of a path that was taken and also what uh, he is doing to give back to other pilots to help you guys come up in the uh, aviation world and get to that job that you want to get to. So, Sean, thank you for being on the podcast. He flew in all the way from Denver today just to do the podcast, so I'm very gracious about that. Thanks for being here. Well, of course, it's a pleasure. Any excuse to come down to Phoenix, obviously, <laughs> we we always link up or get breakfast or lunch or something along yeah. those lines and catch up like like we did when we first met. So it's great to come down and, and partner with you and, you know, obviously Sierra Charlie with the nonprofit and it, mm-hmm. it's uh, great. Anything we can do to contribute to the industry and, and help others is, is the point of this. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, I'm sure the audience will get a lot of value out of it and, uh, and maybe some motivation and, and we'll just start it off. So first off, uh, Sean, you got to Southwest at 25 years of age which is very quick. Um, Typically in the past, it's taken anywhere from 10 to 15 years, depending on if you're a civilian or military. You got there really quick. Tell us your path that uh, you took getting to Southwest. Exactly. So when I when I first started, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a pilot. My parents would tell you that the first toy I picked out in a toy store was ironically an airplane. So <laughs> the, the joke was, is I always wanted to be a pilot. So my senior year of high school uh, and kind of junior two, they said, hey, you know, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a pilot, just like I always said. They're like, all right, you're serious. So we looked at different uh, colleges, different pathways uh, through, through the long story that could be told there. Mm-hmm. I chose the University of North Dakota. Uh, I thought it was a good school, and I actually attended a summer camp there, Mm -hmm. uh, my junior going into senior year, and stayed in the dorms and ate in the cafeteria, and that kind of opened my eyes to what UND was like, and I could build my other college visits based off of that. And that was uh, your junior year? That was my junior year. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know a couple different college programs Mm -hmm. offer them, but the only camp I attended was uh, UND's. It was a week long, Mm -hmm. and you got to go up and do uh, maybe three flights, a couple simulators, a couple Mm -hmm. briefings and kind of have the college feel yeah. and i fell in love with the school and used that base knowledge of this is what college is like when mm-hmm. i attended the other schools to kind of compare and contrast could i not just walking around the campus but you learn for things to look for through that i, I learned that of mm-hmm. hey look at this or hey i really like this i don't like that so that was a great experience and how i picked und what uh t- what were some of the other schools uh, i visited uh, embry riddle down in daytona beach mm-hmm. i visited purdue western michigan uh, University of Dubuque, all programs that have a very highly accredited flight schools. A flight and, school. Yeah. Yep, they all had flight schools, and at the time, uh, I don't regret getting a commercial aviation degree. I wish I would have diversified a little bit and yeah. gotten a minor, but that's a whole different tangent. But yeah. ended up on the University of North Dakota. Uh, my senior year, uh, I took the advice that I was given in the summer camp of, I know it's changed now, so this mm-hmm. isn't the exact advice I would give to people now, but get your private pilot's license before you show up to UND. Interesting. Okay, it, so that's what we did with my daughter, and I, I feel 
for us, we wanted to make sure that this was what she really wanted to do before investing all that money into yeah. to that. Was that pretty much the same? Uh, I knew I or? wanted to do it. The advice I got, and I took it, and it worked out in my favor, was when you came to UND at that time, they already had a course where you could take an abbreviated pilot pilots course and go right into your instrument right when you started. Uh, so gotcha. I saved a whole semester doing that. Uh, now, obviously, things have changed. Some people don't fly their first semester, mm -hmm. so the playing field has changed. But that kind of gave me a stride. My, my biggest advice to people is, when you're touring schools, you know, ask them, can I come in with any experience? Can I get my written done? Does that count? You know, mm -hmm. so to play off of what I did, you know, ask questions when you're on your visits saying, hey, can I come in with my written already done? Or right. can I do this? Or can I do that? You know, do you accept a private pilot credit, you know, if I come in with the license? Or do I have to redo it? Mm -hmm. uh, and would you recommend the uh, junior year of high school doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean, as soon as you can. Uh, I don't know all the requirements for, you know, first solo, you know, first mm -hmm. time you can take No, no, I meant for the visits but, for the school. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because realistically you start applying the um, uh, fall of your senior year and you start mm -hmm. hearing back in the spring. So if you're doing your college visits when you should be applying, I'd say maybe the summer of your junior year, maybe spring. If you go for spring break, you can do a road trip. That's what we did. Stopped mm -hmm. at a bunch of colleges. Yeah. Uh, but that's just – that's opinionated advice. Yeah, but no. That, it worked out really for me because I did the summer camp and I had a base. And then when we did a big road trip, I was able to compare and contrast the schools back to back to back. And it was all fresh. Mm. So when I applied, I applied to the schools that I thought I'd fit in the most with. Not, oh, I'm doing it right in this moment, driving right. around and applying at the same time. What, when you went to the summer camp, was did the other schools offer summer camps as well? And you had to pick which one you needed to go to? Or uh, To be honest with you, it was just dumb dumb luck. I was on the internet looking at colleges, uh -huh. uh, and they offered a summer camp, and I knew nothing about UND, and I told my parents I want to do this. And they said, <laughs> are you serious? And I said, ah, I guess this is a way for me to find out if I like it. So wow. maybe that was my test going uh -huh. into it, you know, a week camp. Okay. Uh, but it was It was great. a week long. Uh, yeah, maybe six days, or but okay. yeah, about a week. Yeah. Wow. So. How many other uh, students were there? Uh, I'd probably say about 20 people were in our summer 20. camp. And it was kind of cool because when I was an instructor at UND, every year I picked the the college kid camp, uh, uh -huh. the campers, and I was their instructor when they visited. So it was kind of oh, cool. You got to pay it forward again. Like, hey, yeah. I was you know in in your shoes three years ago. Like, you can yeah. do it. You know, so it was kind of motivational. And oh, that's cool. A couple of them ended up actually coming to UND. So it was really cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, do you still keep in touch with uh, the summer camp folks? Uh, too, there, there's one I keep in touch with. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them, I, I don't know what happened to them. You, know, yeah. you, you lose track over time. Right. But yeah, there was one that actually went to UND. And, uh, but the person I've kept up most with is actually your daughter, you know, actually, oh, yes. obviously. Yeah. But uh, she wasn't a summer camp person. Yeah. But yeah, so that, that's how I chose UND. Uh -huh. And uh, once I got there, I did everything I could with came in with my private pilot's license, and I took as many classes as I could at the beginning to start knocking out all the mandatory classes that you mm. need to take to move on to, hey, you can't take this class before this. How many credits were you taking while flying? Uh, I was a full-time student. I want to say I was taking, uh, I don't want to, I want to say I was taking like six classes a semester, so 18 six, credits. 18 credits. Or, it was okay. usually like three classes a day. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. 18 Tuesday, credits. Thursday. I mean, that's a lot while while flying as well. I mean, right. It's a pretty full load. And and at night I worked, but that's a whole different Whoa. shebang. And, but that that was part of it is is you can't give up on yourself. You have to from the beginning if you actually want to be successful, you have to have a dream and mm. then a plan, a step plan of how you get there, and sure. have little wins along the way. Yeah. Of hey, yeah, this is going to be miserable my freshman year, but I'm going to take two more classes than the recommended amount are. So that's going to help me move forward. And you can have the little wins along the way. Every semester you see that you're, you're checking these boxes. And eventually when you go down the line, you go, wow, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of everybody. And you go, wow, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm achieving things. And, right. you're, and it's the little wins. You just have to be determined with grit. No, I like, I like the little wins. Um, I think in any kind of you know, intense program that you go through, whether that's in the military or flying or anything, they always talk about, the little wins are going to carry you to the big victory. Hundred so, percent. Um, Cause it's easy to look, you know, stand at the entrance and look all the way down towards the end. And that's a long way to go. It, it's intimidating. You, yes. People, when they go it's in. It's deflating, right? Uh, completely. Uh, when with, with the nonprofit, we see kids and adults that are second career people of, Oh, I'm a realtor and I, I want to jump over the fence and, or a flood attendant that once moved to their side of the door and they see the, 
however much dollar loan, hundred thousand plus loan, mm-hmm. and oh my God, can I keep my job? I go, yeah. So that's what my biggest recommendation to people is: if you're actually going to do it, anything in life, if it's even if it's just saving up to buy a car, saving mm-hmm. up to buy a rental property, you have to do everything in your plan to find your goal and have a bunch of steps in between. Yeah. And how am I going to achieve step one? And little victories along the way. Okay, yeah. I made it to step one. Now, how right. am I going to do it to step two? Yeah. It's the same with flying. There's every step, private, instrument, commercial, multi. Right. You have to take the little wins along the way. Like, first time I did a flight instructor lesson, I porpoised the airplane down the runway. <laughs> I went home. As thinking, the instructor. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, for, well, first in the right seat. So I was okay. in the CFI course. I had oh, my, you were doing the training. I was the training. Okay, gotcha. So I'm coming in. We were doing a landing, and I just porpoised the heck out of the airplane. And I was like, oh, well, that was, that was a flaw. You know, yeah. I think a couple hundred hours. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a pr- commercial pilot. What the heck? Yeah. Came in again, porpoised it down the runway, and I couldn't believe it, you know, and those were setbacks, but you have to stay determined of mm-hmm. stay the course and find the little victories along the way. And the next lesson, I didn't porpoise the plane. So yeah. we all have our highs and lows, and there will be times where you go, wow, like, I can't even believe I just did that today. Yeah. But you, you have to see through that for the long-term goal. Well, let's dig deep into uh, to college life at UND, um, you know, with all the the projects that you have on top of flying, on top of schooling, on top of working, so you can have a little extra money. Yep. Um, describe the average, describe how it went from, you know, because when you first get there your freshman year, you're overloaded. Completely. The, the complete sensory overload. You've got all this stuff going on. You're trying to develop your, what is going to be your new normal daily habit pattern. Describe to me how that was in your freshman year and how it kind of progressed and evolved to your your senior year yeah and and even beyond the senior year just the the same thing in life of keeping patterns and habits like you said like for Mm -hmm. example i always signed up for 8 a.m classes and if there's any college kid out there listening to this you're probably like (laughs) 8 a.m this guy i don't know i don't know about this guy but if you sleep in every day until 10 there's people out there already taking classes for two hours longer than you already you know, flight instruction two hours longer than you. Mm-hmm. So you you have to have the determination and, and willpower to wake up and take early morning classes. That's yeah. what I found to be a successful key. It's because I could get all my classes in for the day and be done by noon. Mm-hmm. I could have, you know, three classes a day, like I was saying, you know, you have an eight and you know, maybe a nine or a 10 and then an 11, mm-hmm. whatever, three classes. And you can be done by noon. So now you have the opportunity window from 12 to whatever it gets dark to flight instructor to get a job or Mm -hmm. to get back and do something with your fraternity or sorority go to the uh, dining hall Mm -hmm. but you have that whole afternoon of now open time i have Mm -hmm. to study a little bit but that that would be what i would say is is for habits of Mm -hmm. early load your morning because if you have your first class at 11 which a lot of my (laughs) friends did because they went out or right you know they they were in college so they you know what did whatever yeah um they were in class now till four and You know, now you get off, you're like, oh, I'm hungry. And then you have to, well, I have a test tomorrow, so I have to study. And now what time left do you have? You have right. nothing because you go to bed again. All right. Or you're up partying all night. So mm-hmm. that would be my suggestion on daily habit schedule of try, try to start early. What was the most difficult part of developing that habit pattern? Uh, definitely the peer pressure of not just peer pressure from other people, but the pressure inside of you of uh, people feel FOMO or I, uh, I want to go to this party or, mm-hmm. oh, I, I want to meet new people. So I have to go to this or, mm-hmm. oh, so I'm going to be out late. So I don't know if I can make my 8 a.m. or, oh, uh, so it's, it, I'd say more so of pressure. And I'd say the biggest advice I can give to you, anybody is, you know, people are going to like you for who you are if you're a good person. Mm-hmm. And just because you didn't go to a party because you're valuing your future and your education mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you're, you're not cool or you're not going to fit in. Right. You, you, you will find your path. It may take you a little bit longer, but mm-hmm. you, you will find your path. What, uh, you know, you, you mentioned peer pressure, a lot of friends. Did you find that most of your friends that you really hung out with were similar to you or were they pretty much? Uh, I'd say the, the core group of people. And yeah. It took a while. My first semester, I lived in the dorms. I kind of was like, yeah, I don't really fit in with some of these people. Yeah. And I kind of just felt like I was going through the motions and uh, met some really good people. My flight instructor actually was the person that goes, hey, man, we really get along. Like, <laughs> do you want to come hang out with my friends? Yeah. I was like, dude, you're like two years older than me. And I thought yeah. that was so cool. But yeah. took him up on it, and I got along with all of his friends, and that led me down to – so I was just patient, and I mm-hmm. said, I'm, I'm going to find someone that I will fit in with. And 
they invited me to play volleyball with them at the wellness center at UND and mm-hmm. I played I joined their volleyball league. And oh wow. So you you also have to, you know, be comfortable with going out of your shell and yeah. I, mean, I was nervous playing volleyball with upperclassmen as a freshman. I, mm-hmm. I was super nervous, but <laughs> you know, you show up and try and the worst thing that happens is okay, I don't have to hang out with them again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, getting out of your comfort shell. That's what college is about, right? You know, Absolutely. you're going to be exposed to all different kinds of people. Uh, a chance to learn from a lot of different people from different walks of life. Um, people come from everywhere. From and everywhere, right? I was at the time living in Maryland on the East Coast, and mm-hmm. there's people I met from Las Vegas and, and different backgrounds, ethnicities. Everything comes together, so it's kind of a melting pot. So yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to go outside of your comfort zone. You do. You do. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. All right. So UND, you finish. Uh, you know, carrying this big load. You finished in. Three and a half years. Yes. So you finished a semester early. Yes. To include flight instructing. Yes, I had. I had the the restricted ATP minimums were a thousand hours through right. the approved program. I think I had thirteen or fourteen hundred. I was over the hours. I was. You had thirteen or fourteen in three and a half years. Yes. I. Wow. And uh, I graduated on December eighteenth or twentieth, mm-hmm. and I was in ground school January third at SkyWest, like at ten Sky days West. later. So was that the uh, cadet program that SkyWest had? Yeah. So or? I was in the UND uh, SkyWest cadet program. Okay. Uh, if you ask me why I joined that program opposed to every other one, all my friends were in it, and they all oh, had really you. good things to say. Okay. Uh, my flight what instructor does, what, went there, and he recommended it, et cetera. So. So what does the cadet program give you? Uh, at SkyWest. I, at least when I was through it, and I believe it's the same thing, it gives you a seniority number. It doesn't mm-hmm. give you a pilot seniority number, mm-hmm. uh, but your date of hire is technically when you get on. So for benefits, 401K, uh, the matching, mm-hmm. uh, your company seniority for when they send you your five-year gift. Oh, wow. So your company seniority starts when you get on. At the time, it was preferential hiring, preferential interview. Oh, wow. uh, So okay. it wasn't like a guaranteed job or anything like that. But yeah. it, you know, basically what they said was if you go through the program, you have a good record, you stay clean, you're, you're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, And you had to do an interview, but it was very laid back. It was, mm-hmm. it was, uh, it was everything UND taught us. So it was kind of a, a easy breeze, if I can say that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's pretty quick. What do you think? What, what were some of the traits that you feel got you to SkyWest in three and a half years? Because the average is a lot longer than that. It's four, a little, maybe a little, even It is a lot longer. of, uh, I guess a lot of people, uh, it, it, and again, it, it depends on how you structure your day. And mm. that's kind of goes back to what I was saying before. And you were mentioning of habits. Yeah. Of I always started early. Once I was in the back half of my flight instruction time, I didn't have to take three or four classes a day because I front loaded my college experience. So all you did was fly. Yeah, maybe one or two classes, but mm-hmm. again, they were early, mm-hmm. eight a.m. I was done by nine or ten, so now I had from ten to the whole day to fly. And did you do that? You oh, flew yeah. the whole day. Yeah, I was always a full time instructor, even if I had full time class load. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was always going full time, and I, I don't, I couldn't do it now. I, <laughs> <laughs> I get my schedule at Southwest now, and maybe uh, I'll pick up one or two days. And but I, yeah. I was doing it seven days a week. Well, you know, like I told you, it, it like put the work in now, so later you can pull that throttle back a little bit, right? You, you totally can, and and uh, I'm doing a, a kind of a talk later this month or next month at the University of North Dakota. Mm-hmm. I'm a speaker at their conference, and I haven't finished my speech but one of my topics is you know you guys are set up for success mm-hmm. you know and it is up for you when you're at the you know it's in the bag if you put it in the bag mm-hmm. you know if if you go to a self checkout and you try to steal or you try to you know y- you can get the item it's yours mm-hmm. your, your career is yours uh, but you have to do it right you know if, if you put in the hard work like you are right in the slot to be lined up for success mm-hmm. Uh, but you just have to see it through. Don't think, oh, I'm a CFI. I'm a big hotshot. Mm-hmm. You, yes, you are a hotshot, but you're on the way. Mm-hmm. You're not quite there yet. Mm-hmm. So keep doing it. It's in the bag if you put it in the bag. Yeah. You know, someone else isn't going to do it for you. So yeah, I, I, you got to put in the work. You do. And the earlier you put it in, I mean, the sooner you're going to hopefully achieve your goal. And mm-hmm. There's ups and downs or furloughs or. Mm-hmm. pauses in hiring, which is somewhat happening now. And I, I've talked to a lot of people who are defeated about it. Mm-hmm. And I said, I understand that. But what are you doing now mm-hmm. to prepare yourself for when they're hiring again? Yeah, You are at the front of the line and go, look what I just did when you weren't hiring. Yeah. I was doing this, 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 and this. Because, yeah. you know, most people think, oh, I'll just fly a little bit and I'll show up and apply again. Yeah. But 
everyone else is doing that. So how can you set yourself apart? That's, you know, and I, I think I put out an Instagram post on that was, you know, don't worry, or it was, I think it was, I can't remember what it was, but I was trying to get out, hey, you know, I, I hear a lot of negativity right now about hiring. Don't, don't let it defeat you. Don't worry about it and get anxious about it. Just worry about what you can contribute. So absolutely, if it's just you worrying about what you're doing, it takes the stress level down. So, yeah, all this noise is going to happen. Don't worry about that. Just keep plugging. Totally. Yeah. And, and again, it's all about find other ways to make yourself happy in the meantime. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're stuck, stuck, but if you're flight instructing or you're at a regional and you can't upgrade, well, what, what can you do in your off time to really further yourself? It may yeah. be working with our nonprofit. It may be working at a food bank. It may be going to see your, your, your parents more often, mm -hmm. you know, so find things in the meantime that can keep you up, pick up a new sport, you know, and it's things to talk about. It's things yeah. to make you happy. So right. take advantage of even the downtimes because mm -hmm. that's sometimes where you can grow the most yourself. It's right. easy when things are good. So I completely agree with what you're saying. You talked about UND. Got a good grasp on that. You got to Sky West pretty early, three and a half years. Tell me about the Sky West training because I hear it's, it is lights out very good. Yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Sky West for pretty much every aspect, and the training is at the top of that level. It's mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they hold your hand to a certain extent because it's your first time ever in the airlines, first time you've ever ho uh, flown a jet, but they do it with uh, firmness. I say it's <laughs> it's, it's uh, very rigid. Uh -huh. uh, they're very standardized, uh, which is great. Which is great. Which is what you need, the, especially when you're learning. What, Everybody needed. Mm -hmm. um, we were, I mean, I was a multi-engine instructor, so the difference between that and a Cessna is 30 or 40 knots, you know. Right. So it's not much of a difference, but no one had flown anything faster than 150 knots, and now mm -hmm. we're going to go fly 300-plus knots So yeah. it, with a turbine engine, a jet turbine engine. So mm -hmm. it, it was a big difference, a huge learning curve, uh, but they were fantastic. I mean, they had a lot of people who had similar backgrounds to us that could relate to us. Uh, the ground school was about a month, about just normal. They mm -hmm. had, gave us a lot of checklist training time and systems training time to understand, you know, if you push this button, here's what's going to happen, you know, on the screen in front of you, here's how it's going to, plane's going to react. So when we went into the simulators, those guys were hardball and they yeah. were very serious, but you were ready. Yeah. And, you know, having a good structure of footprint of training before with uh, standardization and consistency mm -hmm. helped you. And it helped me big time when I went to Sky West. So it was somewhat seamless, but mm -hmm. they were rigid. And yeah. I, I'm really great. At the time, I was like, wow, these guys are overkill. But looking <laughs> back on it, I, th I think they're absolutely fantastic. No, you have to have that attention to detail, um, especially when you're first starting out, because you want, a, you want a solid foundation, right, of standardization. Because you got it at Sky West, and now when you go on to Southwest or whatever other airline, you know, Southwest is expecting you to have that foundation already. Yeah. They're just building more upon it. So I, I've always heard great things about the SkyWest training. So give me a, uh, a survival trait. Like if you were going to be successful at SkyWest training, what is one trait that you absolutely must have? Uh, I, I'd say that uh, one trait. I could give you a couple, but one is uh, definitely a trait of, of being open to new uh, thoughts and opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, just like when you jump company to company, you don't want to be that guy in class that raises his hand and goes, well, at my last company, <laughs> this is how we did it. Yeah, don't be that guy. Yeah, not so good. <laughs> but it, you have to be willing to learn to adapt. Right. And it's just like when you go to college for the first time. When you go to ground school, there are people from different flight schools that have no structure. There's p people from the military with a whole different type of structure. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be different people with different backgrounds. So it's like college again, of you mm -hmm. have to be willing to adapt again. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be willing to not just study in your room like you did for an exam for, you know, English 101. Mm -hmm. Yet, you, you know, being in a group study is important, I think, mm -hmm. you know. Do you guys it, have a lot of group study? Big time. And, yeah. and that's kind of, I think, my biggest trait or suggestion to survival guide is, you know, the people around you that you're sitting with, become friends with them, or if you don't get along with them, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. someone in the back, you're probably going to get along with or have something mm -hmm. in common. Your pilots, you, you know, 
we, we like some of the same things mm -hmm. and find people that you get along with respect, you know, whatever it is and stick with them and hunker down, you know, do a little bit of studying on your own, mm -hmm. but then go to a group study. Because if you're studying by yourself, you may be interpreting something wrong in the policy, right. or you may have just misheard the instructor when you were taking notes and you wrote down the wrong thing. Where if you're in a group study, someone can go, hey, hey, I think you, you're misunderstanding that, or uh, I think you wrote that down wrong. So then you're not learning something wrong the whole time. So yeah. I'd say do self-study, but be open to you know getting a beer in the lobby with everybody and reviewing everything, because yeah. that, that'll really help you, because everyone has different... Uh, viewpoints on everything yeah i've seen that uh um with these last few classes yeah, maybe it was about a year ago but uh for some reason i, I was going through captain upgrade that's what uh -huh. it was so i came to do laundry remember at your uh at uh, the hilton <laughs> the, the anatole, hilton anatole. Yeah. That's so right. i walk into this this laundry room and there is a mock-up of the 737 and there's about five people discussing you know, flows and, and I mean, it watered my eyes because it was awesome to see. Yeah, and some of those people may not, well, I, I had done it this way. There weren't, some of the people I hung out with at that cockpit trainer weren't even in my class. Right. You're just waiting for your laundry to get done. So you hop in and pull up a chair and start listening to them yeah. talk and do their checklist flows. And yep. you're like, well, I didn't know that. Hey, by the way, I'm Sean. You yeah. Know, so it's uh, coming out of your comfort zone again. Like I mentioned, you know, it all is building, but it's the same thing. You're yeah. doing the same things, whether you're in college or the regionals or Southwest United. You're, you're using mm -hmm. all the skills and traits that you learned earlier and applying them again. Going out of your comfort zone and meeting people that are three classes ahead of you. Yeah. Because they, they may know something you don't. How long did it take for you to get comfortable on the line at SkyWest? At SkyWest, uh, it I think when I showed up to IOE, I was pretty confident that I could fly the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think my scope, you know, that was like this. <laughs> yeah. if, if the flight went well and maybe a little abnormal situation, yeah. I could handle it. But once you got flight attendant or passenger issues and now fuel issues and weather, I started to, to, to lose it. So yeah. I'd probably say six months to a year. The uh -huh. first six months, I was really having to focus, go back in and review some of the books and manuals because yeah. eh, I have a high expectation for myself. But mm -hmm. it probably about six months. About it, six it, months that that holding on to the tail is a real thing. That's <laughs> a is. real thing. No, 100%. 100%. That was definitely my, you know, my first experience with an airline was at Southwest. And I do remember that first day vividly because I don't remember anything else but you know, getting in, doing my flow, you know, mm -hmm. the blinders are on, you're just trying to get everything done, but there's distractions with, you know, passengers, flight attendants, there's distractions with weather. Oh, you know, they're switching the runways, yeah. uh, you know, wherever you're going. And, and you were military and corporate, so yeah. you had never had I've 170 never had people. Nope. You have an ops agent right. yelling at you. Yeah. you know, we love our ops agents, but, you know, <laughs> they're saying something. Yeah. So it can be a lot. Yeah. So again, it's patience and you know surrounding yourself with good people. Of you know, hopefully you work for a company that has good people and mm. you know, Southwest United Delta. They all have good people and mm. you, know, you get the job done. You have to have patience and delegate. Yeah. It's, now, okay. So about six months to get comfortable. You upgraded at at SkyWest. I did. And how long did it take for you to get comfortable in the left seat? Uh, amazingly, a lot. Quicker than I thought. Yeah, because uh, it was the same airplane, right? CRJ? Same airplane. Okay. Uh, if it was a different airplane, I think it would easily be six months again. Yeah. Or a different airplane, you know, CRJ to ERJ, at least right. six months. But I was an FO because of COVID. Everything, you know, I was supposed to upgrade right before COVID, and it got canceled. So I was an FO for almost three years. So I had a reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. for an FO and pretty comfortable. And I learned that it's pretty much the same thing, but in the left seat but you just have a lot of more delegation and the scope becomes bigger. Mm -hmm. So I think the flying portion of it didn't take any really getting used to. Same plane. They trained mm -hmm. us really well at SkyWest, as we talked about, but opening your horizons to, I'm not just an FO. I don't just do my checklist and the walk around. <laughs> now you got to dispatch, the right. flight attendant, briefings, You know, doing better briefings, and your ops agent. And mm -hmm. That took probably a month or two. Yeah. Uh, and then I started feeling really comfortable right at the time that I left. I was a captain about four months. Four months. So not, not very long. But right when I left, I was kind of bummed. Uh -huh. Not really. But <laughs> <laughs> I was just really getting confident. Hitting your stride. It, yeah, a couple hundred hours. And, yeah. and I felt, all right. Like, well, 
describe the difference between the two training, your new hire training, you know, everything's new. Now you're going through captain upgrade, which some of it's new, but you kind of got that you've got the flavor that they teach to. So totally. I, I think that um, the expectation level was a lot higher. Uh, mm-hmm. When you show up to initial ground school, they go, here is what an AOM is. Does anyone know what an AOM is? And <laughs> no one knows what that is. So right. they go, you know, this is what the A means. This is what the O means. Yeah. The M, you know, but in Captain Upgrade, they expect you, just like a, if you go to Southwest or United, they expect you to know how to fly the plane. They right. expect you to know how to read all the charts. They mm-hmm. just want to train you to the way they want you to act. Mm-hmm. So I'd say that there wasn't really any training of here's how you fly an ILS. It mm-hmm. was if you didn't know that, you're, you're back to the right seat. Yeah. It was more so of do you understand the policy, you know, weather minimum requirements? Mm-hmm. Do you know how to do an MEL minimum equipment list? Do you know how to call dispatch and talk to maintenance at the same time, yeah. more regulatory because I mean, you're the boss, you're in charge. Right. So right. I, was that the same for you? They expected you knew it all pretty much, and they just honed in on specific parts? Yeah, so I my experience was, you know, I was the expert of the airplane in the right seat, like systems, um, general knowledge, that kind of stuff. I I showed up, and they expected me to show up as a systems expert. Right. Now they're just going to teach you more leadership, more like like you said, opening up the aperture a, a little bit more. Hey, this is what we got to start thinking about. You know, you're dealing with dispatch, you're dealing with, you know, weather, what are your alternate minimums? Like what is the considerations with all this stuff? Um, you know, fuel, um, you know, a lot of regulatory stuff really getting deep into the weeds and then the MEL, right? Logbook, logbook, logbook. Yeah. That was the biggest. Yeah. Clean logbook. Uh, <laughs> that was the biggest thing, I think, was managing, you know, logbooks, write-ups, um, you know, just stuff that you see on the line as an FO, and you're like, oh, that's captain stuff. We'll let him take care of that. That's why he gets paid the big I'm bucks. I'm going to do the so walk around. I'm going to go do the walk around. I'll be right back. Um, so, yeah, they really concentrated on that. But like you said, this, the j- training was really good. But there is definitely an expectation of you having a certain knowledge base that they're just going to build upon. So if you showed up, and no, nobody in my class did this, but I've heard of classes in the past showing up not prepared, and they were basically washed out. Totally. So, And I think that could even apply back to trying to be hol- holistic here of, once you get your private pilot's license and you go for your commercial license, if you show up and you don't know what the weather requirements are, right, it's not going to go very well. Right. So this isn't just a, oh, I'm going from FO to captain. I mean, it, it, all of this applies through your whole training mm-hmm. or any job. If you, right. you know, if you're a editor and you say that you're an editor and you show up and you, you, you don't know half of the stuff, that's not going to go very right. well. Right. So it's a it's a building block of using the same characteristics and traits throughout your whole career, yeah. of every step along the way. Tell me about your experience with uh, Southwest as far as the interview go. Uh, the, I'm sitting right here, by the way. Yeah, and, <laughs> no, and Ernie was there the day I did my interview, uh, <laughs> but he was he was hiding. He, I was. He didn't. I don't. I don't think he influenced anything. I it was a, it was a fair interview. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was tough. Uh, I, I had a very pleasant experience through the uh-huh. whole thing. Uh, it had changed. It has changed since I went through. You know, we were still on the back end of COVID with virtual parts of the interview. Mm-hmm. and uh, But everything from start to end was fairly seamless. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone was in. They, they made me feel welcome. Uh, I didn't do any formal interview prep with mm-hmm. a company or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was through the advice of many others, you know, asking you questions, you know, be yourself. Be someone that you want to fly with for three or four days because mm-hmm. we assume you can fly the plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just want to know if you have the skills and traits to be a Southwest or you know, whoever, Delta pilot. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I focused in on learning experiences, uh, telling stories of experiences I had. Mm-hmm. I wrote a bunch of them down and thought, okay. Oh, that's great. And I thought, okay, if I get asked this kind of a question, I have a couple of ways I could go about it. So I did prep, uh, mm-hmm. but... I did the HR part where I had a couple stories kind of on a piece of paper in front of mm-hmm. me during the virtual interview, of, and mm-hmm. I was, like, peeking out. I was like, oh, yeah, this would be a good story to tell. You know, I was kind of maybe using a crutch a little bit, but <laughs> uh, telling honest stories. And yeah. then uh, went down to Dallas for a logbook review and make sure your logbook looks nice. And mm-hmm. uh, they ask you questions like, oh, I see here you wrote in big letters, you know, emergency yeah. like, or, or something like that. So mm-hmm. uh, if you're doing an interview, I guess – if you write a remark, first emergency, you know, mm-hmm. they're going to look through and they may ask you a question. Like right. That. 
And, uh, you know, a couple other questions after that of a scenario based training of, hey, what would you do in this situation? Or mm -hmm. if you had a, you know, a lavatory overfilling with water, kind of mm -hmm. nasty, but what would you do? Like, yeah. you know, now the water's coming into the cockpit. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You're at 37,000 feet. So a couple scenarios mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, you can't really prepare or interview prep for. You have to just use your experience. Mm -hmm. So very seamless. The interviewers were great. And I'm not mm -hmm. just saying you didn't interview me, <laughs> but uh, everyone was really great. And, and I've also heard that about other airlines. You go yeah. to Delta or United, they've, you know, they, they want you there. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, yeah. they, they want you to be a part of their, their organization. Yeah, I could say that, you know, if you've made it to the interview, we've, ex we've assumed several things. Number one, you know how to fly. Um, number two, you have stories. And number three, you, and this is what we're really trying to figure out is, do you have the personality, the temperament to kind of mix into this company culture that we have? Totally. So um, when, uh, when I talk about, you know, and I give, gave you advice, right, on, on when you're going to the interview, have your stories, your experience, but write them down because when you write them down, this is prior to the interview, obviously, when you write them down, you bring up stuff in your mind, you recall things that you Absolutely. probably forgot if you're on the spot. And then when you make that detailed, you know, whatever it was, an emergency, and you put a lot of description in there, you're filling in a picture, a canvas, and you're filling it in with color and, and all that. And that gives the interviewer, number one, okay, he's not making the story up because, believe it or not, some people make up stories in interviews. <laughs> but uh, we, can, we can see through those really quick. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you have a lot of detail, if you have a lot of, you know, expressions in there, because if you have a, an emergency, you're probably, especially your first emergency, I mean, that probably gets you excited. I know my first emergency, my first engine yeah. failure in a C5 got me excited. You know, and that was one of the stories I told in my my interview. Right. But uh, I remember it. I remember everything about it. I remember what it smelled like. I remember the, the the heat. You know, because the cockpit was hot and it was in the desert in like uh, I or I think it was uh, Kuwait going to Iraq and you know right. like everything about it. If you put down those details, you put down, put down a lot of color and and kind of emotion into it, it, it makes for, number one, a better story. Number two, when you back it up with, this is kind of what I learned from it, and this is what I do today, you know, as a cross-check in my mind, it shows you've learned from it, too. So You're a well-rounded person. You've had experiences, yep. and yeah, yep. that's exactly the whole point. So, yeah. So, interview tip, write down all your experiences, your emergencies oh. that you have that really come out. Um, just write those down on a piece of paper, because it's going to jar a lot of a lot of things that are stuffed in your memory that you may have forgotten, when you're starting to write it out and really think about it, it really comes out, and that'll help you out in your 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 interview prep for your interview. Totally. You know, some people gave me the advice, and I actually didn't do it. I regret it. This is a regret was someone said, yeah, when you have a engine failure or something like that, write, write them all down. Oh, I diverted for anti-ice failure, mm -hmm. and we had four inches of ice. Well, I remember that one because I was – quarter scared you know <laughs> but yeah. you know we did fine but uh -huh. you know i wish i would have written that down of like yeah this is what we did so then mm -hmm. when i got to the interview instead of like oh i wonder what i did you know you mm -hmm. could have a list uh, yeah. so that's a maybe a little pro tip of to help you prepare for an interview you can go oh i have all these experiences uh, written down yeah good let's uh let's go into southwest training now like tell me the differences you know that you perceive between the southwest training versus the skywest training uh, so it was uh, close to opposite. Really? Uh, and I guess that to a certain extent, but from what we've been saying, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, w I came in, uh, my wife uh, is a Southwest pilot too, mm -hmm. and uh, she gave me some tips and tricks of, hey, this is how it's going to go. You know, She said, you're probably going to be bored half the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you mean? When I was at <laughs> SkyWest training, I was furiously taking notes and, you know, like, panicking that I wasn't going to remember it all. And she goes, well, it's, remember, it's the same stuff. You know, it's, mm -hmm. we operate under the same rules, you know, just a bigger airplane and a new company. So mm -hmm. uh, they expected you to come in knowing, just like your captain upgrade, you know, they expected you to know a lot of it. You know, yeah. they, they weren't teaching you how to fly an arrival. If you didn't know that, you <laughs> go back to your regional. Yeah. You know. There are some expectations. There are right? huge expectations, I would say. Uh, they they expect you to more so study on your own and know how to study already. Mm -hmm. uh, they have like a couple days of systems, but that was what a lot of people were holding on to the tail per mm -hmm. se. 
is they thought, oh, my God, we only have three or four days of systems. Like, oh, my gosh. So everyone was panicking, and that yeah. goes back into the group study of helping each other out. But a Southwest training I, I thought was good. My favorite part of it that I have the highest praise of any training I've ever had was actually when we got out of the classroom and into the simulator training. Yeah. The simulator training and the CPTs or CBTs, whatever they call those training devices, mm -hmm. the training there was fantastic. Mm -hmm. They were incredibly patient. A lot of the guys that we worked with were – in the standards department, or they were uh, line pilots, the check pilots, or they had flown 737s and retired, and then they came back to instruct. Mm -hmm. So they had wealth of experience. Uh, but I'd say the biggest thing was they, they expected a lot from you. Yeah, yeah. And it was very laid back, but it was, you know, I don't want to say it was like gentlemanly, gentleman club, but they, they, it was an understanding that if you show up prepared and you do, you're trying, mm -hmm. they're going to get you through. They're, they're going to help you. I would I would say attitude will save the day in Big training, time. right? If you show up, like everything else in life, if you show up with the right attitude, um, number one, you're going to be you're going to be really prepared for the training. But number two, you're going to get a lot of help because if you show up with the right attitude, these instructors will bend over backwards for they you. They will. Yeah. And you got to think, you know, too, is that they do this five days a week for you know, yep. fifty two weeks a year, so. When they get a student that comes in, even if you're not the sharpest or the best, if you're trying, mm -hmm. they're going to pour into you more than they'd probably pour into someone that thinks they're the best, and but they're really good. Yeah, They, they, they want to see that. Yeah. They appreciate it. It makes their job fun. You're willing yeah. to learn. So True. It, it helps everybody. I, I think that's fair to say. So attitude, 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 and effort. Right. So. All right. Now you get onto the line. How right. long did it take for you to be comfortable – on the line at Southwest? Uh, sh shorter than SkyWest because yeah. I had that building block. But yeah. I, I'd say probably a couple months. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Oakland and Vegas, that time I was one month in Oakland, one month in Vegas, and then the rest of the time has been Denver where I live. Mm -hmm. Those two months where I was commuting and on four-day reserve blocks is a blur. Yeah, uh, it, it goes by so fast, <laughs> it does. and you're getting rerouted all the time, which doesn't help. So yeah. it's a blur, and uh, you're brand new, and you're meeting a new captain every leg. Mm -hmm. So I had I didn't have trouble with having good landings, or but it was hard for me to get comfortable because on reserve, new company, and we were at the time slightly understaffed when I first got here because we were building back up again after COVID. Mm -hmm. I was flying with a new captain every other leg. Yeah. So it was like right when I just got to know that, all right, Bob is from uh, Monument, and he has two kids, and his wife is a nurse. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice to meet you, Bob. You know? Yeah. And then the new guy comes in. So right. I'd say once I got a line, it was very consistent. It was mm -hmm. the same captain, and it, it I hit my stride at that point. So a little bit more A couple months. Yeah. So and it gets overwhelming. And as you know, you you commuted to L.A. for a while as mm -hmm. a new captain. And yeah. that's a lot. It's, you're in a new position. You're commuting. You're right. trying to get a hotel for the night if you don't get called. <laughs> right. Oh, wait, now I'm going to Honolulu. Oh, geez. Yep. You know, so it, it can be overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's slowing down and having patience is, is, is huge. How long uh, how long have you been on now? Uh, just about two years. I just finished my second Almost recurring two years. Wow. So, so what's the, uh, what's the biggest advice you would give to people coming to Southwest? Southwest in particular? Yes. Uh, Ooh, that's tough. Or any airline in particular, I, uh, I guess. Man, the biggest advice with, with your dream job, it, treat it as if it's your dream job. Once you already have it. Uh, I, I've heard of captains, and I, I've just heard of this in general. I can't give you a specific you know, person or anything. Mm -hmm. But remember that you did everything that you could when you were a private pilot to go, I want to go to Southwest. I want to go to Delta. You'd do anything to get that job. Yeah. And you're doing the baby steps, little win at a time, little win at a time. You get to SkyWest or Endeavor. And when I was at SkyWest, I'd do anything to get to Southwest. Mm -hmm. Don't get to your dream job and go, Yes. I got it. I don't have to worry about it. You have to, and it's easy to do, but fight to keep your dream job. Mm -hmm. Stay current, still study, you know, show up to recurrent and show that you care. Mm -hmm. uh, keep fighting for the job that 10 years ago you would have done anything for. Yeah. I think that's my biggest advice. That's why I didn't know about particular. Yeah. Uh, no, I love that. I, I always said that... We want to be able to pull interview tapes 
of you 10 years from now saying you would do absolutely anything to get this job because this is where you want to be. Yeah. Um, and are you that same person 10, 15 years from now? Yeah. It sh- you should be. Right. Since it's your dream job, right? You would think. I, 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 don't, <laughs> so, I don't know if that's always true. It's Yeah, no. I, and, you know, we're all human, right? Like we're all going to have the days where we're rerouted, where things happen, and it's frustrating. And it's okay to get frustrated, right? Totally. It's, it's just how do you deal with that frustration, you know? If it's self-destructive, then that's not helpful, you know? If it's like, hey, you know, what can we control in this situation? Sometimes it's nothing. Well, what I can control is my attitude. And I'm upset right now, and, you know, I don't want to get ja to another day, uh, although under the new contract I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, whatever it is, like maybe, you know, my daughter has gymnastics tur- a gymnastics tournament, and yeah. I'm going to miss that, you know. Totally. It's, it's a part of being in this industry. This is what happens. And you can't let your attitude deteriorate when those bad times happen because, you know what, bad times don't last forever. They, they don't. And, and again, it, it's the kind of going back to what I said before, I don't know if it's the best way to compare it all is, you know, time, time, times are easy uh, when they're good. If yes. times are good, it's, it's pretty easy. Mm-hmm. And you can build a foundation when times are good for when things go wrong where you can go, you can rely on that. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, my wife and I, we always, every night that we're in town, we, we, we do everything we can to have as many nights in town as we can together, both mm-hmm. being airline pilots. We bid the same days, and we've already talked about what having kids looks like mm-hmm. one day or how do we want to do this. And even if sometimes we don't see each other for three or six days because we're doing back-to-back trips or opposite yeah. schedules, you have to put in the effort. And so like the little effort you know, I was talking earlier of it's a lot of work. You know, mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to do that, but you can build on a foundation and you can go, hey, I understand I got Jade, honey, or you know, tell your son, I'm so sorry I missed this, but mm-hmm. I, I'll be there the next time. I'll make mm-hmm. it up to you. Yeah. And that's going to happen. It's an unfortunate reality with our jobs, but if you can – rely on the foundation of I will come through later. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's fair to say, of, of building on a rock and it, it will yeah. be successful. Yeah. Well, now I want you to tell me about your nonprofit Project Aviator. What was the genesis of that? And, uh, and yeah, just describe it for us. Uh, I'd say the, it, it kind of started after I got hired at Southwest. I had done my I got the job offer in February and March of 2022. And instead of what I was saying earlier in the show, I was saying, instead of getting to your dream job and going, I- I'm done, I quit, I go, I kind of was thinking to myself, oh, well, what now? Yeah. And my wife kind of laughed at me and she goes, well, what do you mean, what now? Like, <laughs> you did it. You know? yeah. And I go, yeah, but you know, I want to do something else. Yeah. And because we were already doing our master's degree, and she's like, "We're doing your master's. Both of us are doing our master's. And uh-huh. now, you, what, what what else do you want to do? We're already pretty busy." And yeah. I said, "Well, hey, uh, my wife, who was an intern at Southwest uh, with with the hiring and safety team, uh, she had mentors that helped her. Mm-hmm. I had people like yourself that helped me, and it was this big culmination of, I, I want to find a way to give back. Mm-hmm. My wife and I at the time were already volunteering for Women in Aviation." Uh, She was in the uh, Chicago chapter for fundraising of like silent auctions and she was on the scholarship committee. So I kind of tag teamed with her and I helped, you know, read some applications and, Mm -hmm. you know, not that it was bad. It was great. Women Aviation is a great organization. And I thought to myself, well, I joked with her one day. I said, I think I could do this better. (laughs) And she just starts laughing at me and Uh she goes, ah, yeah. And I was like, all right, forget it. And a couple of weeks later, you know, Something happened where my wife was thinking, oh, yeah, were you serious about that? And I was like, yeah. She goes, well, what would that look like? And I go, well, I love women in aviation. I love PAPA. There, there's no issue with any of the organizations. But I thought, well, what happens if we just made it a nonprofit organization for pilots? Mm-hmm. Just not women in aviation, men in aviation, or mm-hmm. black pilots, gay pilots in aviation, just not so, in one group, just pilots. Mm-hmm. I go, that, that's not really out there. No, that's true. And she goes, well, there's Professional Pilots of Tomorrow, which is a good organization. I used to volunteer for them, and they're a great organization. Uh, but I thought, well, I think we should do this. Mm-hmm. And she was like, hey, you're kind of crazy, but I, I think it's a good idea. And I go, so yeah. So I go, okay, well, what are we going to name the organization? So we're thinking, thinking, and 
we came up with Project Aviator because it's our project to help aviators. Oh, cool. That was what we thought. It was not yeah. very original. Yeah. No, uh, I like it. <laughs> but we started it and called up a couple of my buddies who both were at the uh, regional airlines. Jake Spellacy mm -hmm. and MJ O'Connor are their names. Good guys. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And they were all in behind it. You know, they said, we know nothing about anything. And I said, <laughs> I don't know anything either. Yeah. And they go, well, how are we going to do this? And I said, well, let's not put like tens of thousands of dollars into it. And I'll read some books and I'll go on the IRS's website and I'll figure out how to do it. Yeah. I filed with the IRS, the state of Colorado, on my own after reading a couple books. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got rejected the first time and had to reapply. What would you, you get rejected for? Uh, they, I think. I think they just thought we were like jokesters. <laughs> uh, maybe they thought we were like some shell company or something yeah. trying to like pass all of our money through a nonprofit. I, yeah. I don't know. I remember in my letter to the guy, uh, his office was in Ohio. I don't remember his name, but I, you know, I filled all the paperwork, all the forms, formal. You know, I was looking up the legal jargon to use correctly of right. you know, what we're doing and our mission and all the categories and subcategories. There's a lot. Yeah. Not to get into it, but I wrote a side letter on the side and I stuck it in the packet and I was like, sir, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm really doing this for a good cause. Yeah. And that was during the second application. And he wrote a letter back and he goes, I'm actually very impressed. You're approved. You know, he's <laughs> like, really make sure you file all the filings and deadlines if you're not going to hire lawyers. And because most people hire someone really professional to do sure. it. And uh, we got approved and I was, let's be honest with you, shocked. Oh. Then didn't know what to do, so I yeah. had to start a bank account, and mm -hmm. we have an EIN tax number, and so it was a lot of overwhelming stuff, and I handle all that today, mm -hmm. and uh, so now Project Aviator is born. So we didn't even think we'd get approved, Yeah, uh, honestly. So now you have this Project Aviator, and, uh, we this had, nonprofit, and you're like, okay, oh, it's geez. really happening. <laughs> yeah, wait, literally, and yeah. uh, I had no idea what to do. We didn't even really have a game plan. What did we want to do with this? We just said, we're going to start a nonprofit. And we actually got approved, and I called everybody. I was like, we did it. And they're like, oh, now what? I, go, I don't know. <laughs> so we came up with Project Aviator. Now today it's incredibly established. We've, we've doubled in size the last two years, and mm -hmm. I couldn't be more thankful to our mentees, mentors, donors, supporters, because mm -hmm. that's what's had it grown. Yeah. Uh, project so go, A yeah, go sorry, go ahead. So go 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 into that. You mentioned uh, your mentees right. and mentors and Project Aviator has kind of like a two forks in the road mm -hmm. uh, of two kind of divisions within the nonprofit that 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 are running full steam ahead. We have our mentee mentor program, which is run by my fantastic wife, who uh, finds uh, people that are well on both sides, professional pilots like both of us mm -hmm. that want to give back. Maybe they don't want to learn how to file for an IRS EIN number and start a nonprofit, but mm -hmm. they want to give back. They think, wow, this is cool. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to mentor somebody, you know, someone at the regionals or a CFI that's about to get their first job. I, I think I could give them some advice. Yeah. Uh, so she finds people to apply, and uh, we, we vet them a little bit, you know, yeah. resume, make sure they're the real deal. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the coin, we have mentees. Uh, people like, you know, I've helped you know, talking with your daughter. Your daughter's in the perfect spot. You know, she's time building, flying a Cirrus. She's flying right now. Or, mm -hmm. you know, you're at UND and you're a CFI and you're six months out from your first interview. Like yeah. you are right in the prime, prime sp slot to get introduced to somebody in the industry. Mm -hmm. You're about to go in for your first interview. You know, maybe you're the first generation aviation like I was. I had no idea. I, my resume, the first resume I had was three pages long. So I wow. thought, yeah. well, I thought, look at all this experience <laughs> I have. I, uh, you know, I worked in the wash bay washing airplanes. Yeah. You know, that's it. And then I had a mentor when it, during, you know, at my time. And they go, oh, Sean, one page, one page. Mm. And your flight time should not be down here. It should be up here. Mm. Yeah. But a lot of people, you'd be surprised, they don't have that. Yeah. Uh, so that's what our mentor-mentee program is all about. Mm -hmm. Taking people from not just CFI, but you know, commercial instrument, right when you're 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 committed, mm -hmm. and you're on the path to make it to your first job, and we're gonna match you up with somebody. Yeah, help you through your training. Hey, this is my first check ride. Like, do I have to wear a suit in the middle of August in Phoenix? Eh, maybe not, or mm -hmm. maybe to the oral, you know, show yeah. up in a suit. But what do you wear? You know, do you? Anyways, things like that. Mm -hmm. And our goal is 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 it's a replenishing pond. It's just like a pool of fish they replenish. Mm -hmm. Is once you are a mentee and we help you get to your dream job, you become a mentor. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and you, we, you can keep supplying our, our, our pool of applicants and, and mentors. So how do you a, get, how do you apply to be a, a mentee? Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, and we have links in our Instagram, Project Aviator, or mm -hmm. you can visit projectaviator.org, and at the top of the page, it'll say mentorship. Mm -hmm. Click down, and it says click here to apply for a mentee. Same uh, site, same way. If you're a commercial pilot uh, mm -hmm. at Southwest or SkyWest and you're watching this, mm -hmm. you go, yeah, I'd like to give back and help you know someone out. Uh, we expect once a month, check in with your person. So if you have 10 minutes once a month and you want to mm -hmm. do this, you know, go to our website, projectaver.org, mentorship, click here to apply to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. So mentee, mentor, same site, same slot. Okay. And we'll pair you up with somebody. And mm -hmm. let's just say it doesn't work out. Hey, uh, I don't know, this guy, I didn't really get along with him, or this guy has different career aspirations than I have advice for. Mm -hmm. We'll find you someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it doesn't cost anybody any money. That's a part of our program is we, we are fronting this and, People are volunteering their time, and, and, and my wife, she runs that aspect of the program. Yeah. Uh, so right now, uh, I'm really proud to say that we have about 120 mentors oh, nice. and a little bit over that number for mentees. Perfect. Yeah. So we, we, we always need more mentors. Sure. Uh, that's usually the restricting side of the house. We have tons of people applying all the time, and yeah. we're like, yeah, we need more mentors. We need more mentors. Yeah. So if you're out there listening to this, uh, we're always in need of people to, to, to help grow our uh, um, nonprofit and, and give back. Cool. The other side of the road is uh, through fundraising events uh, where we give out scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not pay myself. My wife does not pay herself. We, we take out zero. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no payment in any form. When I come down and do seminars or next month, for example, we're going to the University of North Dakota. So if there's mm -hmm. UND people watching this, we'll be up there for your conference. I'm speaking at that conference. Oh, cool. What date is that? Uh, that is the 25th of April. That's 25th the of April. Uh, speaking okay. engagement, 11 a.m. for myself, but mm -hmm. it runs all day. And then the 26th is uh, at the airport hangar and like Delta will be there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know all the other companies. They haven't published a formal list, but Project David will be there. I know Delta will be there because I have some friends and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but we, we do this, uh, the fundraising. So when we attend these events, we give out scholarships. So we do fundraising. Mm -hmm. We say, hey, you know, uh, we're going to raffle off a Southwest Airlines ticket, you know, mm -hmm. 10 bucks per entry. And we spin a random wheel generator and give away mm -hmm. a ticket. And, or you could go online to projectaviator.org and click donate now if you just want to donate 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Uh, 50 bucks, you know, people say, oh, it's not a lot. And I go, well, hey, a written exam costs 150 bucks. You're, That's true. We're a third of the way to sponsoring a scholarship. Right. And Project Aviator obviously is growing. Mm -hmm. Last year we raised $5,000, and this year our goal is 7500 I have aspirations to really blow that number way higher this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have found that it, it's, it's amazing just giving out what a written exam scholarship will do to people, mm -hmm. uh, of gaining confidence and steam in their training. Yeah, I've had people, you know, I think 150 bucks, you know, not a ton of money. Mm -hmm. But I had somebody that called us and was, thank you. Oh, my, you have no idea. And I go, I'm confused. It was a commercial student. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, wow, you're through your training. You go, I was thinking about quitting, mm -hmm. uh, but I applied and I just, I don't know why I applied. And you know, they had a good application. Yeah. And they said, I was thinking about quitting, but I, you believe in me. Yeah. And I was like, well, I just met you on the phone today, but yeah, I believed in your application. Mm -hmm. It was really good. And they go, I'm not going to quit now. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. You, I feel like you believe in me, and this gave me the the drive to keep going. Yeah. Uh, so even even small written exam scholarships help people. We're we're doing bigger scholarships this year. A, a Southwest captain uh, has committed to donating a scholarship for a second chance people of. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a realtor now, and they want to become an airline pilot. So that big scholarship will be coming out this summer. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, we're also running a pickleball tournament in Colorado Springs at the Broadmoor June 28th. June 28th. I got I to gotta get into this pickleball, man. Everybody's been talking about it. The, the I haven't fastest, gotten into pickleball yet. The fastest growing sport in America <laughs> and the world. Yeah, that's right here. Okay, it's the fastest growing it. sport. Maybe so. I'll try it out at the Broadmoor. Yeah, yeah. Broadmoor's not a bad place. Not a place to try out pickleball. <laughs> well, no, it's a perfect place. But if you're going to be really bad at pickleball, at least it's nice, that's true. nice scenery. That's true. But uh, that's on June 28th, so we're going to be raising money there, silent auction, mm. um, giving back, and we have a couple scholarships, and uh, Flight Uniforms has sponsored us, so we'll be giving out pilot shirts, oh, and cool. 
So we have we're getting sponsors and, and mm-hmm. we're going to be able to raise a lot of money and give out scholarships. So th- that's the two forks in the road for Project Aviator. Yeah. Uh, we have the mentor mentee side of the the road, and then we have the scholarship side of the road, and and they at times weave and intermingle where both sides of the house come together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we, we have a great team of people. We're always looking for more people. Uh, but th- that that's what we do, and mm-hmm. we're doing the best we can on a kind of shoestring budget. You guys have 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 been doing really well. I think um, Project Aviator. You know, obviously, I get to see it at uh, at CR Charlie with some of the uh, events that come in and. And man, that room is packed with people wanting to learn more about it. They want to get into the program, get a mentor. They're at that point where they need a mentor. You know, like when I was coming through, I had, you know, as an Air National Guard pilot, I had a lot of people already there. So it was kind of built in. You're basically bringing this to a broad set of people. Right. So I think it's I think it's great what you're doing. And uh, yeah, count me in. I'm going to be a mentor and sign up and that's uh, great let's let's do it man uh i appreciate that <laughs> and uh i'm sure you'll be able to help someone just as much as you help me whoever gets ernie is a hey. great mentor oh man i think they're all they're all great and i really like what you're doing um any last bit of words i know we're coming up towards the end here but uh any last bits that you want to I'll, I'll re- reiterate the same points that I've reiterated the whole time is, is learn your habits early on mm-hmm. and, and believe in yourself. Uh, there will be times through financial struggle or weather cancellations or they stop hiring when you're at a regional. There, there's always going to be roadblocks along the way. Mm-hmm. Even when you get to your dream job, you're a captain at Southwest, there's roadblocks. Yeah. Whether it's in your personal life or, oh, no, the company is shrinking now. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Always believe in yourself. Find other ways to diversify yourself and have other hobbies and just never quit. Yeah. Because if you really want something, you you can get it. You yeah. just have to believe in yourself. So no. th- that's what I would say. And it starts with those habits and, and surrounding yourself with like-minded, very driven people. Yeah. And you'll make it. And I think Project Aviator brings all that together with those like-minded, driven people. So, that, that, that is our goal. Yeah. So. No. Great. Sean, uh, you know, it's been an absolute joy watching you progress from when I first met you as a CFI and to where you're at today, you started an uh, awesome nonprofit. I, I know that thing's just going to go to the moon. So I hope uh, you're so. helping out a lot of people. And uh, for everybody listening out there, if you're not on Project Aviator, uh, both as a mentor, as a mentee, man, go to their website, sign up, um, and let's give back to uh, those that are that are on the come up. And if you're on the come up, go get yourself a mentor. I mean, it's free. Right. And they're going to help you. What you need to bring is a good attitude and some some drive and you will be successful. So, uh, Sean, it's been awesome watching you come up, man. Uh, I think we need to go grab some lunch now because it's lunchtime. And uh, and I'll definitely see you out on the line. And for everybody listening. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. We're going to have another one. We're trying to get these things out every two weeks. We've committed to every two weeks. So we'll have another great guest on. Um, So we'll see you again next week. Or in a a couple weeks. Perfect. (laughs) Good to see you, Ernie. All right. Good seeing you too, Sean.